Joan of Arc is France's most famous patron saint. Burned at the stake, her remains were said to have been lost, thrown into the River Seine. Until in 1867, her bones appeared out of the blue. It's a bit like crime scene investigation. You have the remains. Who do they belong to? Some thought it was a hoax. Others, the real deal. France's leading forensic pathologist, Dr. Philippe Chalier, became fascinated by this mysterious and macabre cold case. They are not just bones for me, they are patients. A detective tale that tested Chalier's expertise to the limit. The autopsy of an international icon, where science meets myth. It connects you to the past in a very unexpected way. This is the story of Chalier's quest to find the truth behind the relics that could be Saint Joan of Arc. Paris, France, 2006. Dr. Philippe Chalier was a pathologist. His patients were the city's dead dissecting their bodies for clues about why they died. But he was also France's most famous forensic sleuth, dubbed the Indiana Jones of graveyards. He couldn't resist the coldest cases, long dead kings, queens, and mistresses, whose deaths were shrouded in mystery. I'm a physician, first of all, not an archaeologist or anthropologist. So they are not just bones for me, they are patients. And I look at them as if it would be anybody in the subway or on the streets, but dead, of course. His patient files include the English king Richard the Lionheart and the French king Henry IV. But all the remains, however small, held secrets from the past. Even just a tiny bone, for me, it's a patient. All these bodies are for me patients, and when I look at their bones, I'm just looking like in a patient's uh, file, like a historian book. Chalier was destined to become a myth hunter, and it all began on a trip to the Italian city of Pompeii when he was just seven years old. A volcano had erupted in 79 AD, burying buildings in boiling ash. People were frozen in time. I remember the cadaver of a woman, and this was very important for me because I was facing not a skeleton, but the three-dimensional form of a dead individual, and I wanted to make this individual speaking to me. By 10 years old, Chalier had found a human skull, someone who died some 1,300 years before. He wanted the dead to tell him their story, to speak to him through their remains. So he went on to forge a career in medicine. As a forensic pathologist, he knew he could search for the truth behind history's most famous deaths. In 2006, Chalier had just closed his latest case. He was returning the medieval remains of a king's mistress to a provincial museum in Chinon, central France, when by chance he spotted his next patient. 50 centimeters close to these remains were the relics of the so-called Joan of Arc. Chalier had discovered a long forgotten box of bones, but these were no ordinary remains. Legend said they belonged to France's patron saint, Joan of Arc. But how did they find their way to Chinon? Chalier learned the bones trace back to Paris in 1867. Vast swathes of the capital were being knocked down for one of the most ambitious urban transformations ever attempted. Dr. 
Dr. Charlier wanted to know where they'd come from and found out that in 1867, the attic of a pharmacy had been cleared out and these remains had been found. Near the Place de la République, a pharmacist was clearing his shop's attic before demolition, when he claimed to make an extraordinary discovery. Jars filled with bones, a textile fragment, and a lid inscribed with a message, the remains of Joan of Arc. The Catholic Church took an immediate interest. The Roman Catholic Church had the remains examined to see whether they could tell whether they were Joan of Arc's. Um, they sort of accepted that they were, but it wasn't a definitive conclusion. The clergy took the remains to Chinon for safekeeping, where they eventually landed up in the local museum. So these relics were then left on a shelf for nearly 150 years until they were rediscovered by Charlier. Charlier had little evidence to work with. A broken piece of human rib, a fragment of vertebrae from a spine, the end of a cat's thigh bone, a curious scrap of fabric, and what looked like lumps of charcoal. He faced one of his most difficult investigations, and he'd need a crack team if he was to solve the case. It's a bit like CSI, a crime scene investigation, using a whole range of different experts, many different methods of analysis to determine whether, in this case, relics belong to Joan of Arc. Yes, it was interesting to study these bones, which were absolutely black, and that could have been burnt. The blackened bones instantly reminded Chalier of the history lesson every French child learned in school. Joan of Arc is a peasant girl, and she emerges out of nowhere, really, uh, of almost total obscurity, and erupts onto the historical scene in the most unexpected of ways. She starts to hear voices, and these voices are those of the saints. The voices tell her that she is the virgin who will save France, and that her mission is to ensure that the true King of France, who is the Dauphin Charles, will become crowned. It was 1422. France was in the grip of a power struggle with England. That went on so long, it became known as the Hundred Years' War. The French King Charles VI had just died. The English were determined to stop his son, the Dauphin, Charles, from taking the crown. In 1429, Joan rode to the Dauphin's court at the fortress of Chinon. She told the French prince of her quest to defeat the English, hand him the throne and restore peace. We don't know exactly what she told the Dauphin in secret what was the sign that she gave which convinced him and many of them that she was the true virgin who was going to save France. Whatever she said, it worked. Joan became his military advisor. She was just 16 years old. She seems to be quite willing to adopt the role of a warrior. And this is very unusual. She is uh, someone who seems to be able to take on military command. She bears a banner, a standard, which is her emblem and symbol. She thwarted the English armies in battle and saw the Dauphin crowned King Charles VII of France. But a year later, in 1430, in the midst of a battle, Joan was captured by pro-English French troops. Then betrayed by her king, who refused to pay her ransom. Charles VII 
knew she'd become a dangerous liaison. The church was convinced the voices she heard weren't the saints, but the devil. She is no longer worth supporting. He must not be seen to have owed anything, least of all his kingdom or his crown, to somebody who is accused of being a heretic. Joan was imprisoned. She refused to renounce the voices she heard, certain they were the word of God. The church wasn't impressed. She confuses and, um, and disconcerts her interrogators. She treats them in, in what they regard as an extremely disrespectful way, telling them that they can't have an answer now, they have to wait for a fortnight because her voices will have spoken by then and she will then be able to communicate God's message to them, which, if the clergy are not part of that communication with God, is heretical. A show trial found her guilty of heresy and there was no leniency in the sentence. The normal punishment for the heretic who is obdurate and refuses to recant or abjure their heresy, which is the dreadful, dreadful punishment of burning at the stake. On the 30th of May, 1431, Joan was tied to a stake above a pyre of wood in Rouen's Market Square. A vast crowd was said to have gathered to watch the spectacle. The pyre was lit. It took three attempts to burn her body to ash. What was remaining of the poor girl uh, was deposited as, as ashes into the River Seine. It was highly important that there should be no relics left. Five hundred and seventy-five years later, Chalier gazed at a labelled jar. It said, remains found under the pyre of Joan of Arc, Virgin of Orléans. Could her body have survived the fire? For Philippe Chalier, this was the opportunity of a lifetime to examine relics rumoured to be France's most famous daughter. As a pathologist who'd analyzed anonymous human body parts found by the police, Chalier knew one diagnostic test reigned supreme. DNA analysis uh, has been described as being the silver bullet to all questions, particularly in the past. The double helix, DNA, was Chalier's best chance of proving the bones were Joan of Arc a molecule found in all animal and plant cells. DNA is encoded with vital genetic information, passed down from one generation to another. If Chalier could actually get preserved DNA out of the human remains, it would be possible, one, to determine the sex of the person represented, and two, to compare the DNA profile with living descendants. Chalier knew DNA could last in human remains for hundreds, even thousands of years. So he sent bone samples to forensic genetics experts. If the remains were female, he planned to obtain DNA from her relatives alive today to identify a genetic link with the relic bones. DNA analysis has really been around only about 25 years for looking at archaeological skeletons. 1989 was the first time DNA was extracted from bone. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. 
Chalier awaited the results. If the bones were male, it would mark the sudden end to his quest. It would have been a male. We would have concluded that these women were absolutely not these of Joan of Arc. Then Chalier got the call. It was bad news. The scientists had failed to extract any DNA. His plan to test her relatives for a genetic match now lay in tatters. The reason why there was no DNA was a mystery. But was it possible intense heat, like a burning pyre, could have destroyed it? So there are two reasons why the DNA wouldn't have survived, and that would be that it didn't survive full stop, or that it was destroyed. It's very unlikely to get preserved DNA out of bone that has been cremated. Chalier suspected high-tech science might not give him the breakthroughs he'd need to crack this cold case. To unravel the mystery of the relics of Joan of Arc, he knew he'd have to think outside the box. He had a radical idea, something never attempted before, and he'd need one of France's most highly trained noses. I am a perfumer, I create perfumes, uh, I smell so many things in life and I have a passion for nice odors like flowers, fruits, spices, woods, etc. And suddenly you have someone calling you and say, oh, hello Jean-Michel, I am a doctor, I work in a hospital and I am investigating on the uh, supposed relics of Joan of Arc. Can you help me? I wanted to use noses of perfumers, which are professional noses and quite artistic one also, in order to smell these remains and to know if they have been burned or not. To smell the relics, to see if there's evidence of burning, I think is wonderful. Use any test you can. The sense of smelling is really about detecting molecules, volatile molecules that are here in the air Sometimes quite a few molecules are enough to be detected. They come into your nose and your nose uh, captures them and sends uh, an olfactive information to your brain. Like a sommelier's palate for the complex taste of wine, Jean-Michel Durier's senses were finely tuned to sniff odors with precision. He'd be the first to put the smell of the relics under scrutiny. He met Charlier at the hospital laboratory. Some of the bottles hadn't been opened for at least 30 years. Charlier hoped the scent would be concentrated enough for a result. We were just, you know, placing our nose on the bottle very carefully, as if also, you know, this dead person would be still alive and we don't want to bother her too much. So, excuse me, madame, but can I smell your burnt bones? <laughs> that was a bit strange. Durier sniffed the blackened 10 centimeter long rib fragment. Knowing the history of Joan of Arc, I was expecting maybe to smell um, a burnt odor. And I was surprised because I didn't smell anything burnt. There was no trace scent of fire, but Durier did detect a faint but dense aroma. Evidence that the relics were old. Scent is made of molecules called notes, which have different weights. Top notes give the strongest smell, but they're so lightweight, they evaporate away in minutes. Bottom notes are the heaviest scent molecules, lingering for hours, perhaps even centuries. What we call the top notes are the volatile notes, uh, where completely disappeared. So what I was smelling was more into what we call the dry down or the bottom note very heavy and soft type of note. And the bottom note smelled curiously of vanilla. I am smelling a sort of vanillic note. Is that possible? Is that any possible that uh, a, a burnt bone can smell like vanilla? A vanilla scent was an important clue. It's linked to the sweet smell of bodies as they decay. Valinine is in direct relationship with 
decomposition and putrefaction. So these remains are still continuing their decomposition and putrefaction process. But the smell of decay didn't rule out that the body had been burnt on a wood pyre. The relics could still be Joan of Arc. Just because there was a smell of vanilla doesn't necessarily mean that the body was not cremated because cremated bone can degrade following the cremation. Chalier needed to check if the bones had been burned to look for direct evidence of exposure to the intense heat of fire. But to see it, he'd need X-ray vision. He called on radiologists to put the relics through their CT scanner normally used to analyze living bodies, organs, and tumors. It's an x-ray technique. It produces slices, which are images through the object or the body. And then those images are then reconstructed into a, a 3D picture. Chalier wanted to scan the bone fragments from different angles to generate a 3D model of the bones, revealing the inside and the outside surfaces in minute detail. And he had a clever idea how to identify any evidence of burning on the relics. Dr. Charlier did have control samples, particularly from victims of burning, so that he could actually compare what he saw in the relics with the modern victims. The body is cremated on public places or in a car or in a, in a private place. It's much more close to Joan of Arc uh, death process. Charlier would check both the relics and modern bones for cracks in their structure. Created when bones are exposed to temperatures above 70 degrees Celsius and the bone's collagen starts to disintegrate. What we wanted to know if these remains have been burnt with the identification of little fractures or trauma. The 3D models were generated on screen and Chalier had his answer. We saw that there were absolutely no cremation sign on the screen. The results suggested the relics had not been burned, but Chalier wondered if the Joan of Arc legend could explain why. It takes half a ton of wood and five hours to cremate a body. And the history book said it took three attempts to burn Joan of Arc's corpse. She died in the first fire, probably from carbon monoxide poisoning, but the flames had not destroyed her body. The body was quite intact, only the extremities of the fingers and toes were cremated. So the English people and authorities wanted to burn it a second time. A second pyre was lit. Joan's arms, head and legs were burned away, but not her torso, containing the wettest organs, her lungs, heart, liver and intestines. It's possible after the second burning um, that there was just the torso left, maybe because that's got the most moisture in it, and therefore a third burning was needed to get rid of the rest of the body. The relic bones would have come from her torso. Chalier wondered if they could have been saved from the third fire which finally incinerated her body. We had uh, possible explanations about the conservation of little relics of Joan of Arc. The first one, that as the pyre was not on the ground but upstairs, it may be possible that some bones passed from the, the support down to the ground. Could the fallen bones have been saved by the jostling crowd? Or had Joan of Arc's corpse reacted to fire just like Hindu pyre funerals? and modern cremations had the torso exploded. The other possibility was a possible explosions of the, the body of Joan of Arc. We got a lot of uh, gas that uh, grew inside the, the trunk and the pressure grows, grows, grows and after of course it explodes because the lungs and the ribs cannot support such uh, high pressure. 
It is a known phenomenon that bodies do explode during the burning process. So his second explanation could be true. But Charlier's theory of why the bones hadn't burned didn't account for the radiologist's second discovery. The bones were permeated by a mysterious dark substance that had once been very hot. To infiltrate the bone, the black substance would have needed to be liquefied, which suggests that there was some high temperature involved somewhere. Dr. Charlier had to look under a microscope to find out what was actually in it. Charlier scraped samples of the black coating from the relics. If the bones had been exposed to fire, Charlier thought he might see charcoal particles under the microscope. They found a lot of things, including red blood cells, vegetable fibers, a dog hair, and various other things, but no charcoal. The Chalier's analysis did reveal the substance was a resin. We saw that it was a mixture of uh, organic uh, putrefacted uh, uh, material and also a large quantity of pollens. Pollen grains and fungal spores, which then gave him the result that this was actually a resin from pine tree. Chalier knew pine sap resin had been used for millennia to preserve bodies. If the remains were Joan of Arc, had someone soaked the relics in resin to prevent decay? Chalier wanted to know if all the relics were coated in the same resin. Did it hold any secrets about where or when the bones had been preserved? So he called on a longtime collaborator at the Hospital La Riboisière, Paris. Toxicologist, Dr. Joel Poupon. I know Philippe Charlier for a long time, more than 10 years, and when he wants something, he will have it. And so he, he is very persuasive, and you cannot resist, in fact. For him, all is possible. Unlike Charlier, Poupon's patients are usually alive. He looks for the chemical traces of poisoning or certain diseases in their bodies. But he can find elements in archaeological remains too. He's helped solve some of Chalier's most complex cases. But an alleged saint permeated by resin was a first. All the relics, the bones were covered with a very um, dark brown, dark uh, substance coating. And uh, it was very intriguing. So we wanted to know if the substance was the same for all the samples and what it was exactly. Poupon's experiment would reveal the exact chemical makeup of the resin covering each of the relics. Were they all coated with the same substance? They also put in two lots of control samples, one of which was uh, two bones from modern cremations and the other was a piece of dried skin. Chalier demanded absolute secrecy about the case. Poupon wasn't to breathe a word. I didn't know who, who were working on it, and so we were supposed not to talk about it to, to, to the press or the media. To identify the elements in the resin, Poupon had to dissolve the samples in acid, heated to 5,000 degrees. So you put your sample with the acid in the microwave, you eat, and all is dissolved. Not exactly the same use in your kitchen, but the, the principle is the same. Then Poupon ran the liquid through his mass spectrometer, which would identify and count the atoms in the samples. Chalier wanted the results straight away. You know, Philippe Chalier is very impatient, and especially for this kind of very important study, he wants to know very quickly the results. So um, he phoned me and, Joel, uh, what are the results? Um, I need it uh, tomorrow. The outcome was clear. Poupon proved the relics were all coated with the same resin. But this group included the anonymous skin fragment, too. It seemed there were two different groupings, according to his analyses. One was the modern cremations, 
and the second grouping was the relics and the skin sample. The relics and the skin sample were loaded with the metals iron and phosphorus. Further proof, the bones had decayed, not been cremated. So the high levels of phosphorus and iron in the relics and the skin indicates the decay process that goes on in the muscles and skin. The modern bones had a different chemical composition. There was no link with the relic resin. Now, Charlier revealed the source of the skin fragment. So then what Charlier said to Poupon was, well, actually, that skin sample was from an Egyptian mummy. Chalier had sent the skin sample to test a secret idea, that the relics were coated with a resin recipe invented by the ancient Egyptians. He was right. It was a major breakthrough in the case. The blackish mixture was, of course, bitumen and a kind of balm deposed during the embalming process. These results confirmed us that we had a kind of unity. The coating was exactly the same for all the samples. Chalier was determined to find out whether the relics could be Joan of Arc. And he knew of a test that could help him peer back into the past. Zurich, Switzerland. Scientists at the Ion Beam Physics Laboratory were world experts at dating human remains by analyzing a radioactive molecule, carbon-14. In a way, we are radioactive just by nature. Our atmosphere, our planet is exposed to cosmic radiation, and these high energetic cosmic particles finally ends up in all living organisms, also in our body. Carbon-14 is found in every cell in our bodies, and as soon as we die, it works like a ticking clock. Because it's radioactive, carbon-14 decays at a known rate. So scientists would count the number of the molecules left in the relic bones to tell Chalier when the person had died. We wanted to know, of course, the datation of the relics. We wanted to know if it had exactly the same period uh, as Joan of Arc. As soon as we die, we can't replace the C14 atoms anymore. And at that moment, the clock starts running. And from this, we can calculate directly the age. The cleaned sample material, we, we first burn it to carbon dioxide, purify the gas, and then we reduce it again to graphite. And this little graphite powder is pressed into these bullets. The bullet-like capsules were loaded into the accelerator. Chalier wanted to find out if the relics were medieval or not. but he also wanted to know their geographic origin. So he called on textile historian Christophe Müllerat to analyze the fabric found in the jar. Philippe called me to say, Christophe, I've got a fragment from the relics of Jeanne d'Arc. He want to, to extract the more information possible from everything. It'd be one of the most perplexing cases Mulhara had ever faced. Analyzing the textile was really important. It potentially can show you when it was actually manufactured, where it was manufactured, what the actual cloth was. He had just a small scrap of fabric to analyze, which was coated on one side with the embalming resin found on the bones. The textile was a fragile, 10 centimeters length um, part of tissue with a blackish and brownish coloration and black uh, formations encrusted on one part of the, of the textile. Mulhoa wanted to know what the material was made of, then its thread count, to see if it matched medieval fabrics. 
So when I studied the, the thread, I, I find it uh, linen, but the metal was very fine also, very good quality. When I make the, the count of the thread, I, I find 24 centimeters. The fabric was flax linen with 24 threads per centimeter square, a fine fabric, widespread in Europe for the last thousand years. But as he looked under the microscope, something strange caught Mourara's expert eye. He knew that from the seventh century, European thread was twisted in a Z direction. But the relic thread had an opposite twist, like an S. The thread used to make the textile was always in Z direction. And in this textile, it's S. It's opposite direction. So it's very strange. He expected a Z twist to the thread, and he found an S twist. So he had to start thinking where that textile might have come from. There was no match with European-made fabric, but Moulhara had seen this twist before. All the textile from the Middle East, all the material is in S direction. Could the fabric have been exported to France from the Middle East in the 15th century? Could the strange cat femur found in the relics give any further clues? Chalier had heard that in the late Middle Ages, some people believed the devil could transform himself into a cat. They were said to be associated with witchcraft and heresy rumored to have been thrown on pyres when witches were burned. At least 12,000 heretics died at the stake in Europe and America between 1300 and 1800 AD. But up to 100,000 could have been killed. Joan of Arc's death was the most well-documented of them all. But there had been no mention of a cat. When we saw the, the femur, first of all, we were not sure that it was a cat, and we wanted to show it to a specialist. Archaeozoologist Marilyn Patou Matisse measured the femur. Pat Matisse was looking at a fragment of this cat's femur. People who study human remains have an easy job because there's just one species there. So you want to know what species it is, you want to know what bone it is. You may be able to determine how old the animal was when it, when it died and she was able to determine the total length, if she had had the whole femur, from analysing it. And she decided that, on the basis of that, this femur did not come from a European domestic cat and may have come from somewhere like Egypt. It took four weeks for the carbon dating team to complete their tests and to analyse the data. Chalier had a clear result. For this specific object, you know, we measured the radiocarbon age of 2,355 years. This goes back in the, in the ancient times, you know, it was from the 7th century to the 3rd century before Christ. The bones were between 1,000 and 600 years older than the date when Joan of Arc died. The question mark that hung over the relics led to one answer. They were a fake. These remains are not these of Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc existed, but her remains are not in the glass jar. So we now have the final results of the analysis of these relics, that they don't belong to Joan of Arc. Uh, but who do they belong to? The cat femur was from a large breed found in Egypt, and the fabric twist linked to the Middle East. The bones had been embalmed with a resin just like the recipe used to embalm ancient Egyptians, and the carbon date proved the person lived in late antiquity, the time of the last pharaohs. All the evidence suggested Chalier's patient was an Egyptian mummy. If these remains are not the good one, it's much more interesting to know when it was 
created from which artifact and what was the manner of making this forgery. For Chalier, his investigation was far from over. He was determined to get to the bottom of why this elaborate forgery had been made. Chalier had been drawn into the mystery by the handwritten label, proclaiming the relics were Joan of Arc. Could the text and the glass jars give up the last clues he needed to wrap up the case? Antique expert Robert Montagu took a look. The cover is still intact with um, an inscription on it. it it's a kind of parchment on, with a, an inscription handmade on it. Reste trouvé sous le bûcher de Jeanne d'Arc, pucelle d'Orléans. The text read, remains found under the pyre of Joan of Arc, Virgin of Orléans. The Virgin was a name Joan had used for herself in the 15th century. But the moniker had been revived by the French poet Voltaire in his 1755 poem, Mocking Her Purity. There was another clue in the glass itself. The jars were hand blown and cut off at the base, designed in the 18th century for scientists. Perhaps not out of place in a pharmacy. The glass jar uh, has been broken very recently, almost uh, 40 or 30 years ago, not, uh, not before. But the jar was not dating back from Joan of Arc, but it was from the 18th century. And the inscription was very recent, but with an archaic style. The forger had attempted antiquated writing, but it didn't fool the expert. It certainly wasn't medieval, nor 18th century, but a 19th century hand. Instead of finding the relics, Chalier wondered if the pharmacist had made the forgery in 1867, putting some mummy remains in glass jars and passing them off as Joan of Arc. But why go to all of that effort? The relics had turned up when French society was in the midst of a radical transformation. In 1456, Joan's reputation had been restored when a retrial cleared her of heresy. By the 1860s, she'd become a symbol used by three groups who were hijacking her reputation to gain power. One has to remember the extreme fierceness of the controversies that divide France in the late 19th century over the separation of church and state. And Joan of Arc becomes um, a symbol in that conflict. On the one hand, the Republicans and the Socialist Party claiming Joan of Arc as a figure from the people, triumphing over the oppressive authority of the church. On the other extreme, you have Catholic monarchists who see her as enshrining uh, the notion of a Catholic, most Christian kingship in France. After Joan's death, a cult in her memory had developed. And by the mid 19th century, calls were being made for her sainthood. Then her remains turned up out of the blue. A little pharmacist, maybe, he makes a kind of false reliquary and he presents this to the beatification process in Orléans, saying, look what I found in my home. Look at that. These are the women of Joan of Arc. The church declared the remains might be real and they were sent to Chinon for safekeeping. In 1920, almost 500 years after her death, Joan was canonized. Later, she became France's patron saint a revered heroine. For Chalier, the motivation to make the forgery made sense. But to close the case file, he still had to crack the last part of the mystery. How had an Egyptian mummy ended up in a Parisian pharmacy attic? Mummies have been used for therapeutic activities since the medieval ages. 
medieval medicine, parts of mummies were used to treat various ailments, particularly associated with bleeding. One example being treatment of hemorrhoids or piles. Mummy medicine had lost its appeal before the 19th century, but it was said the building had been an apothecary for centuries. Could a mummy have been left in the attic since medieval times? Or had the body found its way there far more recently? I think there's, there is probably a very strong case for saying that these uh, Egyptian relics arrived in France in the course of the 19th century as a result of the Napoleonic campaigns. The Napoleonic wars were productive of the um, uh, looting and pillaging of all kinds of sites. Mummified corpses of Egyptians were, in fact, coming into France in quite considerable numbers. There are plenty of good reasons why mummified cats, given the status of the cat in Egyptian religion, um, should be found among these mummified collections. These are not medieval relics. Chalier's quest was complete. He'd identified his patient, an ancient Egyptian. The team had carried out their analysis in secret, but one year on, it was time to let the cat and the mummy out of the bag. At the end of the study, when the results were presented to the press and the media, it made a lot of uh, sound in France, and all the people, uh, the press and the journals uh, were talking about it. I was really expecting Dr. Charlier to uh, find that these relics were genuine. We had TVs, we had magazines, we had interviews, etc. And suddenly it became like, uh, like yes, you know, um, a, an important information. Charlier's extraordinary discovery made headline news. And the mummy remains were sent back to the fortress of Chinon for public display. The bones weren't Joan. But for Chalier and his team, it didn't matter. We've seen from this study that you can get such detailed information from the smallest of fragments. I think showed how science can help unravel mysteries of the past. Some people were disappointed by the result of this investigation. On the other hand, I think that the simple memory of her is, is probably uh, enough. Joan's memory will remain for a very long time. The qualities of human courage, fortitude, endurance, that is really what's made her reputation. She's an absolutely exceptional, remarkable figure. The relics are far, far less important than the life story. It doesn't change anything to the person of Joan of Arc, which is unique, which is beautiful, which is exceptional. These are false relics. It doesn't change anything to the personage of Joan of Arc. Chalier's investigation hadn't found Joan, but he had busted one of France's most intriguing myths.